Well, friends, welcome and good morning. We are in our third installment in the book of Esther, um, a series called uh, Fearful Obedience. And today we turn our, our kind of attention towards Mordecai. And, and I do want to say one thing. Um, in, in case you bump into Mordecai or Xerxes, they're both sitting in the same section today. We have pulled people out of the congregation who traditionally look like Mordecai or something. So um, just, it's not a biblical apparition. It, they're members, so uh, just so you know. But um, we are in the book of Esther, and we are really digging into it from a character base um, perspective, and we're looking at what is God doing. Today we're going to unpack Mordecai, and we'll do that in just a second. But um, before we do, I think it's important to note, today will feel just a little bit different than normal. If it's your first time here, it's going to feel very normal. But for the rest of you, um, it's going to feel just a little bit normal. We're not doing application just at the end. We're going to weave it through. And I'm going to ask you some questions that hopefully you're attending to. And you can write down uh, your thoughts on the sermon note sheet on your clipboard, unless your children have already drawn on it, and then I'm sorry. So... um, We'll jump into this. Okay, so we're going to talk about Mordecai today. Mordecai is an interesting character in the book of Esther. We first started the book with Vashti, who was the queen of Xerxes, and uh, she was deposed because Xerxes held a 180-day banquet and war-gathering kind of party, but it was all his generals, and for 180 days they planned the war they would have against Greece. I uh, remember we've talked about this, like the Battle of Thermopylae with uh, the 300 Spartans and stuff. That was the, the campaign they were planning during this 180 days. And then at the end of it, Xerxes thought it'd be awesome to get hammered for seven days. So he threw a big party afterwards and served all the wine you can drink. It was, it was really history's first kegger. And um, at the end of seven days, Xerxes wanted to show off how good looking his wife was. And she said, no, it embarrassed him. I think he probably slept for a little while, then he woke up and deposed her and never saw her again. So those are the first two characters, Vashti being someone who was more than a pretty face, more than someone worth looking at. She had character and integrity, and that's worth celebrating, and we looked at how we view ourselves in light of that. Then we have Xerxes, who's in charge of a huge empire, 127 provinces spanning from uh, India clear up to Turkey and uh, heading into Greece. I mean, he was, he was a pretty great king. He was in control of everything, but he lacked all self-control and uh, kind of mirrored that off our own lives. And today, we turn towards Mordecai. Mordecai is a character who I find completely fascinating because he is an exile. He, in the ancient world, when you lost a war, they took the nobles and the best and the brightest and they took them out of the capital and took them back to the, the new capital, which would have been Babylon for him. And they take him back to Babylon, his, his parents or his grandparents, and there they would have um, started a new life under the rule at that time of King Nebuchadnezzar. So he was, a, he was an exile. He was not a native Persian. Um, he was faithful to God. In this story, we see that, that Mordecai is faithful to to God and the witness God has given of himself throughout the scriptural history, Mordecai is faithful. He is honest. When you look at the dossier of Mordecai, the one thing you can admit and see is that he is honest even to a fault. Then he doesn't cave under pressure. Now, this one applies to us more than any. How many of us don't raise your hands, but how many of us cave quickly to whatever passions or desires drive us, right? Like if there was an In-N-Out burger in, um, in Zealand, you would see me caving in probably multiple times a day because I love it so very much. And, and it's, it's hard. Like we cave into pressure, but what happens when social pressures get so extreme that we've been, you know, we cave into those? Mordecai faced those on the most extreme scale. Scale. We'll unpack that a little more next week, but it, it shows how faithful he was and how he behaved in that sense. And then he has integrity. He's a man of character. His integrity stems from what he knows to be of God and his faithful effort to serve and love God in the context he's in. So we see these things are kind of bubbling to the surface for Mordecai, and it makes us ask the question, what happens when we do the right thing? What happens when good people do the right thing? I would say in this room, a lot of us think ourselves good people, don't we? I mean, for the most part, we're, you know, Zealand's a pretty nice, happy place. I mean, we don't mow our lawn on Sunday. Unless we go to S'more Church, then it's okay. Like, right, we're, we're maybe you're not good people. I thought you were. Um, <laughs> whatever. Um, so we're, we're good people. But what happens when we do the right thing? Mordecai faces this, and we're going to unpack this together, and we're going to look at it through three different texts. 
today. It's all from the book of Esther. We're going to start in chapter 2 and we'll kind of deal with that and we'll close that and move on to the next. The first thing is when life gives you lemons. When life and reality is awful. When I say when life gives you lemons, you say, yeah, make lemonade. It started weak, but you ended strong. All right, so when life gives you lemons, it sounds so nice, doesn't it? When life gives you lemons, we make lemonade. We put a child out in front of a house and make them sell it for 25 cents a cup. It's good. No, come on, let's just be honest. When life gives you lemons, it's usually pretty lame, right? You don't want to make lemonade. You want to throw them at people passing by. You're mad about the lemons. It's not what you wanted. And it's painful and it's worth acknowledging that in your disappointment there is pain. But the reality is for Mordecai, lemons were the diet. He had a lot of bad things going on in his life. We're going to read about it right now in this text from Esther chapter 2. This is uh, the introduction to Mordecai. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shemi, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So we know this. He's a third generation exile. His grandparents were carried off with King Jehoiakim. I can't say his name, Jehoiachin, and um, they were carried off into exile. Then there was his parents, and now he is the third generation in exile, uh, first carried off by Nebuchadnezzar in 586. They were among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman was also known as Esther, and she had a lovely figure, and she was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. How lame is his reality? He's a third generation Hebrew who doesn't know what it's like to smell the offerings burning on the altar. He's never seen the temple of Jerusalem. He's never been faithfully able to pursue God the way generations before him had because he lives in exile. Not only that, his brother and sister-in-law die and they leave him a parent to a little girl. Now, he didn't have to, but he did take Esther in. But I want you to think with me about what it takes to face reality and accept reality. Mordecai accepted the reality we find in this text, and he lived fully into it. He didn't try to manipulate reality. Um, we were talking last night with, uh, as a family, Erica and I and the kids went to see Annie, and I sang along, and, um, and it was awesome, but we were, we were coming home, and we were talking about what happens if you get mugged, because, you know, we're in Zealand, and that's never happened, and um, people are like, here's my wallet, sir, you know, it's so happy here, um, but, but you come up, and like, you know, what happens, Let's, and so Erica gave the thing, if somebody came up with a gun and said, give me your wallet, and she said, I just look at them and say, give me your wallet, I'm like, I mean, it's awesome. It's cute as all get out. And then we got on this roll of repeating everything. They said, give me your wallet. Give me your wallet. Stop it. You stop it. I'm mugging you. I'm mugging you. Give me your car. Give me your car. No, I'm mugging you. I need it. Nope, I'm mugging you. I need it. By the end, I'm like, <laughs> like driving and laughing because it's awesome. And I look, like you take this specific reality and what happens when you throw a twist? You're like, I wouldn't act like that. I wouldn't act like that. I'd say, give me your wallet. Deep down, someone's like, give me your wallet. There you go. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's my wallet. You probably can't use much in it, but have at it. But, you know, we want to manipulate reality. We want to manipulate what's before us, and, and it's hard to accept what reality is. But if we look at this first application point and the way that Mordecai is going to kind of display himself here, we recognize that the really the first application is that we have to Accept reality so that we can live in the present moment we have. How many of us are dying presently because we're living for the future? How many of us are currently numb and dead because we're broken by the past? And failing to realize that if we accept reality, you get the opportunity to live in the present, even if it feels like lemons, even if it's difficult. You get the opportunity to live in the present. So the question comes back to you, are you in denial of your reality? Are you in denial of your reality? See, sometimes we don't understand how difficult it had to be for Mordecai. Let's take one of the easy ones. He was a father without a mother figure raising a little girl. Now, I have a daughter, and Bella is the greatest thing since sliced bread, the spoon, and milked cows. I love her. She's awesome. If you have a son, stay away. She is not for you, no. 
Okay, that's how it is. I'm just very angry about this. She's 12. All right, um, but, but here's what will happen. I'll pick her up from school, and Bella and I have this weird relationship. She's a little bit more like me, so we, we kind of have fun together. I'll be like, how you doing, boo? And she's like, good. And we have fun, and we talk, and we have our little handshake, and, and we'll drive home. We'll go through the front door, and Bella and I are like, hey. We get in the house, and Eric will be like, hey, honey, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing's wrong. Look at her. Why are you crying? What's happening? And Bella's like, it's just really hard. And she goes and opens up to her mom. I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> Why? We were handshaking and laughing about stuff. Why are you crying? Because her mom saw things that the daft mule of a father just, I was, I was oblivious. Let's have fun. You know, that was my mood. Think of Mordecai. How hard that would be to understand what this girl that he's he's an uh, adoptive father to, he doesn't understand this reality. What if he had chosen not to accept it and been like, you know what, you're just kind of weird and not like me and moved on. But he didn't. He invested in her life. He lived in the present knowing that God had a plan for the future, but he didn't abdicate the present. We have to be people who can no longer accept being in denial of our reality. Have you ever seen someone who's got influenza we're not in that season right now. I checked the monitor, and there's no, like, it's 0% people who have colds and flus right now. But come, like, February, when people are super ghostly, like, oh, and they come in with a swollen nose and puffy eyes, and you're like, stay away from me, you bag of infection. Like, I don't want whatever you have. And they're like, no, it's good, I'm fine. <laughs> you, I think you have a horn coming out of your head. I don't know, something's swelling. Go away. No, it's good, I just want to be at work. No, don't be in denial, and don't make me sick with your weird denial of it. Admit the reality. Now, that's a lighthearted way, but what if you've lost your job, and you refuse to accept that your lifestyle has to change? What if your marriage is in shambles, and you're sitting here going, no, nah, it's cool. I mean, she'll, she'll never leave. He'll, he'll never leave. He'll put up with it. What if we live in denial long enough that our reality becomes a living hell? See, we can't live in denial. We have to face the fact that sometimes our life is very painful, but that doesn't exclude God from being powerfully at work among the painful circumstances we have. We have to wake up and live in the present according to reality. That gives us the opportunity to stay faithfully attuned in a miserable present circumstance to God's long-term goals in his plan. The next thing we see in Mordecai is this. When you do the right thing and everything goes wrong, Mordecai does the right thing throughout this story, and it only gets worse. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done the right thing, and things only get worse? Let's read a story about how that looks for him. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, um, so the king's gate would have been tantamount to like a gathering of the nobles, the influential people, kind of like Congress, but they didn't have as much power. They would have sat at the... um, at the gate and debated things and talked about things and and discussed whatever's going on. So during the time uh, that Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate the king, Xerxes. Now think of this. They guarded those who got into the king. So it's like the Secret Service not liking the president. It would be a bad thing. Mordecai found out about the plot, and he told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king. She gave credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. That sounds nice. All right, all this was recorded in the book of the Annals in the presence of the king. Mordecai sees a mortal threat to King Xerxes. Remind me, is, is Mordecai a Persian? Is he of the Persian Empire? What is he? He's an exile. If you have the chance to take the head off the snake that killed all your people and put you in exile, would you do the right thing? Let's move it a little more modern context. Let's say you're sitting in Berlin, Germany in 1943, and you're given audience, and you hear there's going to be an assassination of Adolf Hitler, and you're like, oh, I could end this thing right now. It becomes a lot more real that he chose to live where he was at and do what was right, even though it was painful. Xerxes was a tyrant of the first order. 
and he chose to reveal the plot and not give in to his own kind of craven desires to maybe get revenge for his people, revenge for the temple of God, whatever religious justification he would need, he could have gotten right there, but he didn't. He didn't do it, and it got worse and worse and worse. He made a good choice, and things got worse. Here's how it looks in our life. Here's how it looks for us. Because in chapter 3, when Mordecai does the right thing, there's this guy named Haman who comes on the scene. And Haman is the worst of the worst. And he begins the process of a holocaust in the ancient world to annihilate all the Jewish people. And Haman gets all the credit for Mordecai's um, revelation. And then he tries to really kill Mordecai and all the Jews. Think about that. He did the right thing, and now it's really working out poorly. Do we trust God in that circumstance? Because I'll tell you this, we have this same kind of parallel in our, in our culture. Let's think of teenagers. Teenagers, let's think of a teenager who decides, you know what? Yes, I could probably have more friends. I could probably do a lot more if I was involved in everything that goes, in, goes on on Snapchat, on Insta, at the parties, the drinking, the drug use, the sex, the whatever's going on. I could be a lot more well-known and a lot more invested socially and have some standing. But they make the right choice. Let's say they don't get involved in that. And they live more Friday nights with mom and dad than they do out with their friends. They make a good choice and they pay dearly on a social scale for it. If we as Christians don't start celebrating those kinds of choices, they will feel empty and alone in them. Because sometimes you make the right choice and things get worse. Chaos seems to speed up. Think about it this way. Maybe you were a hard-working person who worked all your years getting ready for retirement, that golden time when Cocoa Beach calls your name and off you go into the villages where you play ping pong or whatever happens down there, and then and, and you're just going to live the dream. We're going to suffer through winter, and, and then you'll come back and pretend winter never happened, but our scarred lives will admit that it did, and you're just like, oh, it's so good. Let's say you worked really hard. You planned all your life. Retirement's getting close, and it's 2007. Your 401K's fat and happy. You have been in a company 34, 36 years, you're making a great wage, you're 12 months away, and then the collapse of our stock market happens where 40% of the value of, the wa- of, of Wall Street evaporates in thin air, and trillions of dollars just disappear, and your dream of retirement looks a little bit more like the villages according to your children's basement than it does the one in Florida, and you're wondering, what do I do now? And not only that, but now... The economy's retracting wildly, and you're the most expensive, least productive name on the payroll. Who are they going to cut? So now you're unemployed, you've got a tiny 401k, you did what was right, and everything falls apart. Who is God then to you? Did God hate you? Do you see how we need to contextualize and understand Scripture in our skin, in our day and time? Maybe you kept yourself for marriage. And you married someone who polluted your marriage with pornography and infidelity. And you're like, God, I was, I kept my virginity. I did my best. And what, what is this? I did the right thing and it only got worse. Maybe you've got kids who went off to college and you poured into them in their life. You prayed over them while they slept. You prayed with them at the table. You taught them the scriptures. You were invested, involved in church. And they come home after their freshman year with an arrogant sneer and the word agnostic dripping off their lips. And you go, wait a minute, we're a Christian household. Well, I don't know if I believe all those stories, mom and dad. And you swallow hard and go, what? The next year they come back a little more arrogantly saying the atheist word. And you're going, God, I poured everything into these kids. This is my life. What's happening? What's happening? What happens when we do the right thing and bad things come out of it? Things get worse. Does this echo in your life the way it does in mine? Well, here's the hope, and the way we apply this and the way we push this back towards ourselves is asking the question, did you do the right thing in life and recognize things didn't get better? They actually accelerated in the wrong direction. And did that falling away, did that brokenness, did that shame, did that hurt, did that cause you to stop trusting, not just in the social system, but in the identity, the character, and the worthiness of God? Did you shake your fist at God and say, how dare you after all these years throw my retirement to the wind and leave me useless as I am? 
What would Mordecai's life tell us to do in this? It would tell us that not to shake our fist, but to believe in the character of God. That even when we do the right things and things get worse, that doesn't, your circumstances don't dictate the character of God. But our circumstances sometimes are really awful, right? Does anybody else have that or am I just a special one? Right? Sometimes your circumstances are just incredibly lame. And you would do anything to change it. But does that impugn or undercut the character of God? The life of Mordecai says no. Circumstances are just that. They are here and gone. Circumstances come and go. The character of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Is God done with you when things get bad? Is God done with us and we start to wrestle with us identity? Do we stop trusting in a God whose character is set because circumstances have changed? Changed. We have to admit this. Circumstantial change is constant, right? Have you ever gotten on the freeway to go to spring break and you never changed lanes? No, I don't believe in change. I believe in 72 miles an hour and I'm going to Florida. You'd be piled up behind somebody wearing their car as a hood ornament somewhere around Nashville. That'd be the best you could ever do. But for the most part, we have to make changes, don't we? We ebb and flow circumstantially, but the providential hand of God calls us to be something amid our circumstances. And the one thing we have to cling to is that our knowledge and understanding relationally of who God is in Christ Jesus grounds us to the fact that when life's circumstances hit the tank, his character does not. He's still purposefully using us amid those things. All right, what if we look at this? What if we look at it this way and ask the question, what did Mordecai do? What did Mordecai do amid these things? Now, imagine this. Mordecai's facing annihilation of all his people. What did Mordecai do? What's the, what's the kind of rubric or what's the grading scale that he lived into as a person that made his circumstances less terrifying and God on the throne. Let's read about it. Let's look at this scripture in Esther 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. For Dutch people, doesn't that sound like violence? <laughs> like seriously, and I'm, I, I live, I've lived here almost 19 years. I love West Michigan. I love Zealand. I'm a Zealander. I feel the zeal almost every day. It's fantastic. But you people don't scream if you're on fire. I mean, have some emotion, right? Like, you see a Dutch person, like, literally in flames, they're like, oh, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. If you have fire extinguisher, that'd help. But otherwise, I'm good. Here's casserole. Thanks. <laughs> I smash my thumb, and I'm like, oh, God. Why the apocalypse? Like, I fall apart. My neighbors, when I'm in the yard, like, doing any kind of work, because I've got a weird mentality when I'm doing yard work, which is why my yard looks the way it does. But, um, but when I'm doing it, they, they have to be like, that boy has emotional problems. <laughs> you know, we don't talk. We don't talk when we do yard work. We just do work, right? And I'm out there. I don't know what this stupid yard so bumpy for. You know, and they're like, that, what's the matter with him? I know he's from, like, California or Colorado or something, and you know what's legal there. Like, that's the way they treat me. That's the way they treat me. We don't make big emotional displays, do we? But what does Mordecai do? He strips off his robes. He puts on a potato sack. He brings a bag of dirt and a cup of ashes. He goes to the Senate floor, the gate, dumps him on his head, and wails bitterly. Have you ever seen a person do that in Zealand? No. No, because we don't do that. We're not loud. We're not, like, super expressive. And, and it's, it's actually, there's, there's great things to it. But the fact is, if you lose a spouse, a marriage, a child, a loved one, why can't I weep with you? Why can't you just break down and sob? Why wouldn't you? Of course you should. Of course that freedom should be there to weep bitterly. And not care that culture doesn't accept it, but recognize that from your heart is coming a groan that words don't give fair utterance to. So you just sit down and have at it. How nice is it to know that this community, I would rather weep with you than laugh with you. Because if you'll weep together, I guarantee we can still laugh together. We've got to learn the art of being like Mordecai in this. 
That was a rabbit trail. I'm sorry. When Mordecai learned of all this that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. The the edict was to annihilate and kill every Jewish person over 127 provinces, and that included Jerusalem. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's uh, eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went back to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him everything that had happened including the exact amount of money that Haman, we'll talk about him next week, had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, in which, which had been published in Susa. Now imagine this, New York Times, it had been published in Susa to show, he showed it to Esther and explained it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence and to beg for mercy, to plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And she instructed him to say to Mordecai, Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, uh, the king has but one law that they would be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called before the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sends this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai Went, and went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Here's what we see. Here's the rubric for when life hands you lemons. The first thing Mordecai did was accept and acknowledge what was happening. He dealt with reality. He acknowledged what was going on, and then he went into a season of grief. And I've said it before, and I want to say it again. If you grieve in this place, it is not only okay, it is deeply expected by this community that we would get to grieve with you whatever hurts I feel like the church does a horrible job at wanting to get comfortable again. May it never be so of this place when we grieve. When we grieve together, let it be, because that's what Mordecai did. He grieved loudly, awkwardly, and openly, because that's where his heart was at. So he acknowledged his reality, he grieved his reality, and then he looked to God. And this is kind of the cool thing that goes on in this. When Mordecai looks to God, he begins to realize, wait a minute, my, my adoptive daughter's in the king's house, in the king's bedchamber. I may have an ace in the, in, the, in the hole here. And he looks to God and he sees above his circumstance. We live so bound to the immediacy of our circumstances that if we would look up and see God in light of them, they would pale. It's not that they're not serious, it's just that they're not everything. Mordecai looked to God, and in seeing God, he got perspective. And in seeing with perspective, he asked for help. He called out to Esther. He invited her to take part in what was going on, and then he trusted God's plan. Here's the thing. When you acknowledge, when you grieve, when you set your eyes on God, when you invite God to help and God's community to help, 
you find yourself strangely able to start to trust. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Because remember, when Mordecai did right last time, things got worse. And now he's being called to do right again. And now he has to trust God, not only with his life, but the life of the one whom he loves the most. Because we know this in the story of Esther, that every day that Esther was among the king's attendants, getting perfumed and ready to become queen, took a year, Mordecai visited her every day. He loved her. He adored her. She was the only link he had to his Jewish family. He adored her, and now it was no longer Mordecai's head on the plate, was it? It was Esther's, and if she would perish, then she would perish. Now he had to trust God's plan for that which he loved most. And that's where you and I have to wrestle with reality and get out of comfortable Christianity and ask ourselves the question, am I willing to do these things and then trust in the infallible character of Almighty God? When all was lost, now God's plan could take what he loved most, yet Mordecai trusted. He had integrity and he trusted Esther into God's hands. So the question for you to apply today is simple, and it comes back and says this, Are you reactive to life's circumstances? Are you reactive? No way, you can't take Esther. You can't put her at risk. Put my life at risk, not hers. And we react and we kind of, you know, explode. Or are you responsive to God's plan? The difference between a reaction and a response is very important. A reaction is from the animal part of the brain, the reptilian brain. It's kind of a uh, fight or flight, right? That's a reaction. Like if you've ever scared somebody, and they, uh, I love to scare people, I'm sorry. But you scare somebody and they're like, ah, and they like make a face that they normally wouldn't make. That's their reptilian brain taking over and saying you're about to perish. That's what, that's what they think. Or you're like, boo, and they're like, oh, they're a fighter, not a flighter. And you get punched, reptilian brain, okay? That's a reaction. What is a response? A response is the ability to acknowledge your reality to grieve it or to celebrate it, to look to God and then begin to trust in his infallible, holy character that calls you to be a purposeful means of salvation to the world around you. Do you know that Mordecai and his faithful living would redeem people and save people? See, doesn't that have a fun gospel flow to it? Mordecai's faithful living and trusting in God's character and attachment to the present reality allowed him to be a a means of salvation. What if you were presently connected to the reality God's put you in and there's people around you dying and going to hell and you're supposed to be a means of delivering the gospel salvation to them? See, the danger of living in the future or bound to the past We forget that our present day reality is to display Jesus Christ well because we trust him above and over our circumstances, just as Mordecai did. For us, we have to ask, will we be responsive to God's plan? Mordecai was, and Mordecai lived 400 years before Jesus was born. And he never had been in the temple. And he never saw the traditions alive. He only experienced it in his family in a limited circumstance, but he still lived, lived fully for God. How did he do that? It's because he knew God. He was formed in his family and in his faith by the word of God. We have to be people who know, not just know, but know in relationship Jesus Christ because our life is commanded, it is called and commissioned to be agents of transformational salvation to that world. We are supposed to take our broken lives out, transformed into his image, so people can see that salvation is not just for some elect bunch, but it is for all who would receive the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms. How will you respond to the high calling of the cross to know Jesus Christ in the fellowship of his sufferings and in the power of his resurrection? I am certainly exhausted at doing things at my power. I would love I would love to see the church and myself and all of us begin to live in the power of his resurrection for the glory of his kingdom and his name in this world. Amen? Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, today we come and we recognize that the Hebrews, your people, face certain death and we're frightened, but you delivered them. So Lord, whatever circumstances bind us today, we pause and we ask, would you deliver us today? Would you be our deliverer? 
And Lord, we are blessed to know in the covenant of the cross of Jesus Christ that we as Christians, we as Christians are spirit-filled in relationship with you Christians that can speak and relate to you. And Lord, so often we take it for granted and we, we misuse the gift of knowing you through your word, through our prayer life, through our community of faith. Forgive us for that, God. And we ask, would you call us back to yourself, away from all the trappings of church and, and, and what that means, but call us back to yourself. May we hear the name of Jesus in all its beauty, in all its wonder, in all its power. And may we run to the one who gave us his name as a Christian. May we run to the name of Jesus and answer the high calling of all the redeemed, that we who are so unworthy have been saved by grace through faith, not by any of our works, but by the beautiful name and person of Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would reveal yourself. Even as we pause to sing, may you reveal yourself as the Lord over our circumstances and the God in whom we can trust. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're going to sing a song. We've sung it once before, and as we do, um, if you just want to listen to the words and confess it as a prayer, you want to sing along, it's up to you. I just invite you to do this one thing, to be attentive to the name and the power and the identity you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand. Join me. We find ourselves bound to so many things in this world, don't we? They seem to own us. But there is but one thing that owns the life of the Christian. That is the high calling of God through the blood of Jesus Christ to be faithful to his calling. And the only way to do that in this life is to trust by faith in the character of God as he has revealed himself time and again through scripture, your life, and my life. We have to trust in the character of God because the name of Jesus that beautiful, wonderful, powerful name is meant to be exhibited and displayed to the world around you. You are the agents being transformed and taking salvation to the nations in his name. What more purpose could you have? What greater trump card could be played in this world than to know that your life is bound to the eternal message of Jesus Christ and his purposes for you? So as you leave this place today, I encourage you to go and know the one who has redeemed you by his own blood and live faithfully for the one, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has called you according to his purposes that live above the circumstances of this life. And as you do these things, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In this chaotic, crazy world, may the peace of Christ reign supreme in, in your heart and the witness of Christ be supremely seen through the lives you live. My friend, you, my friends, you are dismissed. The church must leave the building.